watch CNN, I watch Fox, I watch CBS, and in this case, there's a lot of things not being said. It almost certainly is a recombination event that, that was laboratory driven. This is just the essential nature of Chinese communism. Chinese communism is evil. Every person it harms is directly attributable to the Chinese Communist Party. I began looking into the origin of the now widely known coronavirus in early February, with its timing amid the Hong Kong protests, the Taiwan elections, and the U.S.-China trade deal. My name is Joshua Phillip. I'm an investigative reporter at the Epoch Times in New York, writing about the Chinese Communist Party's programs of espionage and unconventional warfare for well over a decade. Videos and messages from Chinese citizens leaking through the censorship suggested the situation was much worse than what the regime was reporting. As my research progressed, initial answers turned into more questions. I soon realized there was much more to the story than we were being told. Today, the coronavirus is impacting over a hundred countries around the world. Billions of lives are at risk. And from what is said by the Chinese Communist Party, this allegedly started spontaneously in the seafood market in Wuhan, China. Wuhan is the capital of Hubei province, the largest city in central China. Huanan Seafood Market is located in Jianghan district of Wuhan city and is a large comprehensive market that includes pork and a variety of frozen seafood, flavored spices, as well as some game meats. The first thing that received public attention about the epidemic was an internal notice from the Wuhan Health Commission. There has been a continuous occurrence of pneumonia cases of unknown cause. The notice issued on December 30, 2019, clearly required all medical units to report similar cases of unknown pneumonia. The notice started spreading online, and on December 31, 2019, the Wuhan Health Commission issued a public notice for the first time saying that some medical institutions found a link between the pneumonia cases and the Huanan seafood market. However, the notice pointed out that there was no evidence of obvious human-to-human -human transmission and no infection among medical personnel. On January 1, 2020, the Huanan seafood market posted a notice of closure. This was followed by a thorough cleanup of the market, which as an investigative reporter seemed rushed. Guan Yi, a well-known Hong Kong expert, echoed my concern that the move was like destroying a crime scene. Since then, Wuhan officials have repeatedly said that most cases of pneumonia in Wuhan have a history of exposure to the Huanan seafood market. On January 26, the Institute of Virology of China CDC announced that 33 of the 585 environmental samples from the Huanan seafood market were found to contain the novel coronavirus nucleic acid and the virus was successfully isolated from the positive culture samples, suggesting that the virus originated from wild animals sold at the market. At this point, Huanan Seafood Market being the source of the epidemic became an official conclusion. A few days later, however, a report from the journal Science published online challenged that story. The report cited a paper in The Lancet, one of the world's top medical journals, and questioned whether Wuhan's novel coronavirus pneumonia could not have originated at the market. The paper titled, Clinical Features of Patients Infected with 2019 Novel Coronavirus in Wuhan, China, was published in The Lancet on January 24. The first author of the paper is Huang Chao Lin, Deputy Director of Jin Yin Tan Hospital, the first designated hospital for treatment of unknown pneumonia in Wuhan. Why would this come as a challenge to the official narrative? I think this journal article is very important. It reveals a lot of important information. For example, this paper talk about the first patient onset was actually on December 1st. This patient is not related to Huanan Seafood Market. 
and also no epidemiological association was found between the first patient and subsequent patient. And then also on this paper, it talk about on December 10th, there were three more onset cases, two of which were not related to Huanan Seafood Market Wholesale. Major discoveries that a total of 41 patients were counted in this paper, and 14 of them proved to be unrelated to the seafood market, accounting for more than one third. No one sells bed at the seafood market too, and the official from CDC did mention they find any bets in the seafood market too. Certainly the Lancet paper showing that supposed patient zero was nowhere near the market. Secondly, that there are no bats in the seafood market or anywhere close. The idea of the spread so fast through a population, just the way it was said through the seafood market, is highly unlikely and improbable. On January 29th, the Lancet republished an analysis of 99 confirmed cases at Jin Yin Tan Hospital, of which 50 had no history of exposure to the seafood market. According to the New England Journal, of the 425 cases confirmed, 45 cases onset before January 1st had no history of exposure to the seafood market. Notably, the authors of the two Lancet papers in the New England Journal of Medicine are doctors and medical experts in mainland China. Daniel Lucy, an epidemiologist at the University of Georgetown, said in response to the Lancet paper that if the data were accurate, the first case would have been infected by the virus already in November 2019 because of the incubation period between infection and symptoms. This would mean that the virus was quietly spreading between people in some parts of Wuhan before the cluster of cases with a history of exposure to Huanan seafood market began on December 15. The first expert group from the National Health Commission arrived in Wuhan as early as December 31, 2019. The expert panel established a set of diagnostic criteria after investigating Jin Yin Tan Hospital of Wuhan that stipulated a history of contact with Hunan Seafood Market, the person having a fever, and displaying the whole genome sequence. All three standards have to be met to confirm a case. This standard was used until a second group of experts, including Zhang Nanshan, arrived in Wuhan on January 18th and made a revision. Why did the panel impose a history of seafood market exposure as a criteria of diagnosis, knowing that at least a third of the cases were unrelated to the seafood market? Today, clearly know about 14 patients not related to Huanan seafood market at all. That clearly means another source of outbreak. I think somehow this could be a malfeasance or somewhat intentionally cover up some important source of infection. It can go a long way to covering up the actual source by imposing a false place and you're not looking at the actual victims, then you're only allowed to find your keys under the light post. The numbers that we're getting from China about new infections and deaths are highly suspicious. We know that Beijing for six weeks in December and January suppressed information of the epidemic. And then when they officially acknowledged it on January 20, they then started a campaign of suppression of information. We know that because the central leading group that was announced on January 26 has a nine person roster and it's very heavy with propaganda officials. Indeed, the vice chairman of the group is the Communist Party's propaganda czar. It appears that uh, the party's main goal here is suppression of information, controlling the narrative. That's more important to them than actually ending the epidemic. I was in China when SARS happened, and we were evacuated, and it's the same. It was the exact same thing. There's no transparency. They tried as, as long as they could to cover it up until finally it was just like with the coronavirus, they could no longer cover it up, and then they proceeded to act. I mean, I think from my perception back then, their response to it is exactly the same. On January 10th, China disclosed the full genome sequence of the Wuhan novel coronavirus, and many of the world's top virologists began analyzing it. As early as January 7th, an academic Zhang Yongzhen 
from the National Institute of Communicable Disease Control and Prevention, along with the School of Public Health of Fudan University, submitted a joint paper to Nature. The paper was published on February 3rd and pointed out that the Wuhan coronavirus is closely related to COVZC45 and COVZXC21, two viruses sampled from bats in Zhushan by the People's Liberation Army. The Wuhan coronavirus has an 89.1% nucleotide similarity to the COVZC45 virus and even exhibits 100% amino acid similarity in the NSP7 and E proteins. Shortly after the paper was published, other scientists used BLAST, a program developed by the National Institute of Health and the National Center for Biotechnology Information, to compare the viral sequence based on the data submitted by Chinese authorities on January 12th. The results matched with Zhang's findings. Another scientist, Lu Rao Jian from the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention and their team also published a paper in The Lancet on January 30. The paper stated that the Wuhan virus has an 88% similarity to two bat-derived SARS-like coronaviruses collected in Zhushan, Zhejiang province of China. The earliest discovery of this bat-derived virus is by an expert from the Research Institute for Medicine of Nanjing Command. A paper published in 2018 states that scientists from this institute detected many SARS-like coronaviruses in bats from Zhushan City, also known as bat-like coronavirus, Zhaoshan virus. In short, scientists found the Wuhan coronavirus, the current pandemic, is highly similar to a bat SARS-like coronavirus previously discovered by the Nanjing Military Research Institute, showing 100% amino acid similarity in NSP7 and envelope protein, the E protein. What does this high similarity reveal? Hard to see a protein is 100% identical when the virus jumps species. And so that was suggesting maybe the virus could be generated with a reverse engineer process. I certainly believe that the 100% amino acid similarity says it can't possibly be a natural mutation. It almost certainly is a recombination event that, that was laboratory driven. On January 21st, researchers from the Institute Pasteur, Shanghai, Chinese Academy of Sciences published a paper in Science China Life Sciences that mentioned an important phenomenon. The sequence of a key part of S protein of Wuhan virus has high homology with the SARS virus. What are S proteins? In the well-known coronavirus picture, they are little mushrooms attached to the surface of the virus. These S proteins, also known as spine proteins or spike proteins, are the most important tool for the coronavirus to invade human cells. If we compare the receptor ACE2 on the cell surface of human bodies to a lock, this S protein is the key, which can unlock this lock on the cell surface and then invade into the cell to propagate and destroy it. That means virus now can infect human cells much easier. And that's probably also one of the important reasons that contributing to multi-organ failure when people have a very severe disease. So it can spread out in the human body much faster. Well, the S proteins, the, that, the, the high similarity of the S proteins from SARS, one to now SARS-2, that's your spike protein. That's the lock and key. That's going to be what drives it right through human cells. And so we know that's the pathogenic spike protein that for the original SARS. So now you're allowing that access to human tissues because the spike proteins of the natural evolutionary strains don't infect human cells at all. So that research has been going on at Wuhan and published since 2007. And clearly, if that spike protein from SARS weren't on the COVID, the new COVID-19 or SARS-2, it wouldn't be able to enter human cells. So again, this is again evidence that it couldn't 
go through the Wuhan seafood market because how did you get that spike protein off the original SARS from bats or any other way? It's lab derived. Research into the virus genome sequence revealed many essential data points. According to a February 28 report in the South China Morning Post, the Shanghai P3 laboratory, which first shared the Wuhan coronavirus genome with the world, was ordered to close by authorities, impeding further research on the virus. Professor Zhang Yang Zhen and his team, who published the genome sequence on January 11th, worked at this laboratory. According to a February 26 report on Chai Xin, Zhang Yang Shen's team isolated and completed the genome sequence of the previously unknown virus on January 5th. On the same day, the Shanghai Public Health Clinical Center reported the discovery to the National Health Commission and recommended prevention measures. No response was received as of January 11th. And it was then that the team decided to publicize the virus genome sequence on virological.org, becoming the first team to do so in the world. Chai Shin also reported that the Hubei Health Committee already notified genome sequencing organizations on January 1st regarding the cessation of analysis of Wuhan virus samples. Existing virus samples must be destroyed. Information on the samples, related to papers and related data, are all prohibited from release. On January 3rd, China's National Health Commission distributed Notification Letter 2020 Number 3, in which a similar directive was presented. Afterwards, the once active Chinese scientific community suddenly fell into an eerie silence. What was the Chinese Communist Party trying to hide? This telling us the Chinese government is censoring this information. They do not allow the samples to be sequenced or do not allow the sequence to be published or submitted to the gene bank. Its response to this virus is extremely troubling. It ignored it for six weeks. It allowed it to spread around China. It tried to get other countries to not protect themselves. This is dangerous, irresponsible behavior, and it's endangered not only the Chinese people, but people around the world. There is no other way of looking at it. They are responsible for the continuation of this coronavirus. And every time it comes back, because it will come back, because it's going to be with us now permanently, it will come back and every person that it kills, every person that it harms, is directly attributable to the Chinese Communist Party. Through investigating the genome sequence, I found it significant that the S protein of the Wuhan coronavirus was critical in its cross-species ability to infect humans. While I was searching for related studies online, one Chinese virologist in particular caught my attention. She spent many years researching bats and coronaviruses. She was the first to locate the key to how coronaviruses can overcome cross-species barriers in order to directly infect human bodies. And she was the first to discover that the SARS virus was the result of a restructuring of multiple SARS-like coronaviruses found in bats. Her name is Shi Zheng Li, and she may be an important link to the origin of the virus. Wikipedia describes Shi Zheng Li as a, quote, Chinese virologist and researcher at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which is part of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Further investigations show that Shi Zheng Li has been a figure of controversy since the Wuhan virus outbreak. This is due to a paper she published in 2015 discussing her own research into synthetic viruses. Chai Xin, a media company with ties to the Chinese Communist Party, interviewed Shi Zheng Li in an attempt to refute these rumors. Dr. Zheng Li Shi is one of the top experts in China. Uh, studying about coronavirus uh, in Wuhan Institute of Virology. She has so many publications from uh, collecting, identify bad coronavirus from bad caves. Her lab has these capacities, and uh, very sophisticated capacity to generate mutations to make it best fit in human expression as well. Delving further into related information, I discovered that Shi Zheng Li published not one, but four papers in total each of which contains important information. 
Since the SARS outbreak in 2003, Shi Zheng Li has been conducting research on coronaviruses. From 2010 onward, the focus of Shi and her team was redirected to identifying the capacity for coronavirus transmission across species, specifically putting the spotlight on the S protein of the coronaviruses. In other words, her team's research in the Wuhan lab has been looking into the part that can make coronaviruses transmittable to humans. In June 2010, a team including Shi Zheng Li published a paper. It describes research to understand the susceptibility of angiotensin converting enzyme 2 ACE2 proteins of different bat species to the S protein of the SARS virus. In the experiments, they also modified key amino acid condens to mutate the bat's ACE2 to examine compatibility with the SARS S protein. This paper demonstrated their awareness of the special relationship between the S protein and the ACE2 receptor. It also signified that she had unearthed the passageway for coronaviruses into human bodies. In October 2013, she and her team published a paper in the authoritative science journal Nature. They claimed a breakthrough in coronavirus research. What was their breakthrough? They successfully isolated three viruses from bats, one of which had an S protein that integrated with human ACE2 receptors. This effectively demonstrated the human infection of SARS-like viruses to humans without the need of an intermediary host. Then, in November 2015, she and her team at the Wuhan lab once again published a paper. This time in the British journal Nature Medicine. They discussed the creation of a synthetic virus, a self-replicating chimeric virus. This virus had the SARS virus as the framework, with the key S protein replaced by the one they had found in a bat coronavirus she mentioned in her 2013 paper. This new virus demonstrated a powerful ability for cross-species infection. The mice infected with this synthetic virus revealed severe lung damage with no cure. This symbolized that Xi's successful splicing of the SARS virus was a key to open the door to the cross-species transmission. What is startling is that these successful experiments on mice were only the tip of the iceberg. They planned to further experiment on primates. Although Shi Zhengli did not indicate any conclusion from this research, her move to research on primates suggests this was to more closely simulate the infection of humans with this new synthetic virus. This wasn't done without controversy, however. Shi's experiments quickly triggered widespread debates from the academic community. Simon Wayne Hobson of the Pasteur Institute in France expressed deep concerns. He told Nature, "If the new virus escaped, nobody could predict the trajectory. Propagation could happen anywhere." His statement is exactly what's happening: that the virus is everywhere, and it could not spread that fast through various countries unless it's been spread via laboratories, via the mail, by a research scientist studying that. Additional studies very strongly support the idea that this new coronavirus came from a recombination event. That is a cutting and pasting of two different viruses. So her work proves or strongly supports the hypothesis that it could not possibly have been generated in a natural zoonotic transmission, but had to come from a hospital setting. The Laboratory setting, almost certainly the biosafety level for Wuhan research facility. However, this did not terminate Shi's research. On November 14, 2018, Shi Zhengli spoke at the School of Life Sciences and Biotechnology at Shanghai Jiao Tong University. The topic was bat coronavirus and its cross-species infection. Reports of this event have since been deleted from the university website. I discovered two more significant pieces of information regarding the dangers of the research conducted by Shi Zhengli's team. First, 
On October 16, 2014, the Obama administration, wary of the potential threats to public health from the gain of function GOF research into SARS, MERS, or influenza, announced through the National Institute of Health that it was suspending funding into similar research. The funding pause included Shi Zheng Li's research project, Genetic Engineering of SARS-like Coronavirus in Bats, a collaborative effort with Dr. Ralph Barrick, a virologist at the University of North Carolina. Second, after the Wuhan outbreak, Indian researchers compared the S protein sequence between 2019 NCOV and SARS. They discovered that 2019 NCOV had four new sequences inserted, all of which can be found in HIV sequences through a search on GenBank. Shi Zhengli discredited those observations, although she never denied the existence of the four inserted sequences. However, scientists probing GenBank found that there were only three viruses containing all sequences. The first is the HIV virus itself. The second is a bat coronavirus discovered by Xi. And the third is this new Wuhan coronavirus. We've done this kind of work for now 40 years for me. There's this sequence analysis and comparison of the virus of the SARS to COVID-19. Apparently has genes that come from other human and other species, including some envelope, the GP41 from HIV. What is the HIV's GP41? The answer I found online describes GP41 as a protein of HIV that acts as the key to infecting human bodies, resulting in the functional failure of the immune system. If the discovery by Judy and her colleagues are established, it would mean the infectious part of the Wuhan virus, the S protein, incorporated the sequence of the HIV key protein. This made me think of the immunodeficiency symptoms in people infected. They were doing research on a human transmittable coronavirus that was actually published in a paper. So this is research that they actually published. They were working on developing a coronavirus for the human host, which you know leads you to question, why would you be creating a coronavirus that can infect humans? What would be the purpose of that research? Is it, is it for a weapon? Is it so that you can then create a vaccine that you are the sole recipient of the profits from. The Chinese have full access to our databases. They have full access to all that research that comes out. They have full access to all our universities to train their scientists. And they have full access to our scientists, like was, you know, with the recent indictment of the uh, head of the chemistry department at Harvard. I mean, this is the Thousand Talents program. Tens of thousands of, of, the, most, uh, of the world's most brightest people in all of these different um, areas that are going to China to help them with their programs. And all of these programs, as you know, have a dual use capability. Beijing's attacks on the United States, which have occurred for weeks and weeks, are really worrying. What it shows is that China is desperate and the United States needs to defend itself because China is propagating this narrative that we spread the coronavirus to China. So the United States needs to just come out with the facts about how China took coronavirus samples from Canada and the United States. They sent them to Wuhan. We don't know exactly what went on in that lab there at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, but it's time for the United States to defend itself. January 23rd, 2020, the Wuhan virus exploded. While Wuhan announced the lockdown of the city, Shi Zhengli and her team released a paper stating that the Wuhan coronavirus was of probable bat origin. This was published in Nature on February 3rd. The paper indicated that the Wuhan virus utilized the same key as SARS to gain entry into the human body. She also announced the 2019 NCOV genome sequence was 96.2% consistent with a bat coronavirus originating in Yunnan, China, called RATG13, signaling a natural source of the Wuhan virus. However, Shi Zhengli's natural origin assertion was doubtful. The outbreak occurred in Wuhan, the same location as the P4 laboratory where she was based, and which housed highly similar 
viruses. Common sense would lead the government to first inspect the P4 laboratory for any leakage incident and potential safety concerns. Instead, they shifted public attention from the P4 laboratory to the South China Seafood Wholesale Market that sold no bats and designated it as the origin of the disease. At the same time, authorities sealed off all virus samples, prevented international experts from joining the investigation, and used national television to slander doctors such as Li Wenliang, who disclosed the outbreak for spreading rumors. If the Wuhan virus indeed emerged naturally, why would the CCP need to censor relevant news or block investigations? Could the Wuhan P4 laboratory have its secrets? Virus samples and genome sequences may be the exact ingredients we need to find our answers. When I first heard of the coronavirus, I was deeply concerned. Almost every disease that starts in China begins in Guangdong province, the province that surrounds Hong Kong in the south. But Wuhan is in the central portion of the country. And so this was extremely unusual. And the fact that it might have started close to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, the P4 Biosafety Lab, really was extremely troubling. It's not a conspiracy theory to think that the coronavirus came from the Wuhan lab. We don't know at this point. And until we know, the theory about the lab origin is certainly something that we should consider. I noticed that after the outbreak, the Wuhan Institute of Virology kept strangely quiet. Under normal circumstances, as the nation's highest level of virology research institute, it should be the first one to actively respond when the entire country is working around the clock, attempting to control a disease like this. One that so closely fits the type of viruses its scientists were researching. In contrast, the Institute had a highly visible demonstration on CCTV of their efforts to detect and prevent the outbreak of virus V in pigs of Guangdong in 2018. It should be noted that the Wuhan Institute displayed a series of abnormal events since the start of 2020. January 2nd. An email from the Director General of the Institute to all internal staff was circulated. The subject was, Notice regarding the strict prohibition of disclosure of any information related to the Wuhan unknown pneumonia. National Health Commission clearly mandates that all detection, empirical data, results, and conclusions related to this outbreak cannot be published on self-media or social media nor disclosed to any media, including state media, or collaborative organizations, including any technical services companies. January 21st, a new drug, Remdesivir, provided for free by the United States to China for Wuhan coronavirus treatment, was preemptively patented by the Institute. February 3rd, Dr. Wu Xiaohua, blew the whistle using his real name that Shi Zhengli's haphazard laboratory management may have led the Wuhan virus to leak from the lab. February 4th, chairman of Duo Yi, Shu Bo, blew the whistle using his real name that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was suspected of manufacturing and leaking the Wuhan virus. February 7th, Top biochemical weapon expert of the People's Liberation Army, Chen Wei, officially assumed control over Wuhan Institute of Virology's P4 laboratory. February 14. Chinese leader Xi Jinping called for the inclusion of biosecurity into China's national security framework and to accelerate the introduction of a biosecurity law. February 15. The Institute refuted widely spread rumors on Chinese social media that a female graduate, Huang Yanling, was patient zero and had perished. However, Huang's photo, CV, and thesis were all removed from the Institute's official website, leaving only her name. February 17, Institute researcher Chen Chuanjiao 
blew the whistle using her real name, the director general of the institute, Wang Yanyi, was suspected of leaking the virus. I graduated from the University of Virginia in 1980. My first job was to go to the National Cancer Institute, which was housed at Fort Detrick, Maryland, the same place that houses the USAMRID, U.S. Army Research Institute on Infectious Disease, the biosafety level four facility equivalent of the Wuhan facility. And so at these facilities, it's where investigators who I went in there myself, you can see the breakdowns in safety and it's everywhere. That's why I have no doubt the Chinese biosafety level four it was just as lacking in safety, in rigor. You can argue that they don't care. Suspected of leaking the virus, military biochemical weapons expert assumes control, biosecurity law. Now, when these sensitive keywords are connected together, it tells me that the P4 laboratory is not an ordinary academic research institute. I decided to start from the beginning of the Wuhan P4 lab. On January 23rd, the day Wuhan was locked down, French website challenges.fr published an article that revealed many details of the collaboration between France and China to establish the P4 laboratory in Wuhan. In 2003, after the SARS outbreak in China, the Chinese Academy of Sciences requested assistance from the French government to build a virology research center of the highest level. With the support of then French Prime Minister Raffarin, the two countries signed a contract to jointly construct the P4 laboratory under a wave of contention. According to the contract, French architect RTV in Lyon was responsible for the engineering of the laboratory. However, Chinese authorities switched the work to a local Wuhan architect, IPPR, based on research conducted by the General Directorate of External Security. IPPR had close ties to subsidies of the Chinese military, some of which were already targets of concern by the American CIA. Within the 12 subsidiary departments, there was even a specific military management office. The French delayed repeatedly, given security concerns. It wasn't until 2017 before the Wuhan P4 laboratory was operational, and French security continued to suspect that the Chinese regime was conducting biochemical weapons experiments. Who is the real boss of the P4 laboratory? The Wuhan P4 laboratory was a subsidiary of the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which is managed by China Academy of Sciences. The director of the laboratory was Yuan Ximing, who was also the head of China's Academy of Sciences Wuhan chapter. Design and funding for construction were the responsibilities of the ex-vice presidents of the academy. Jiang Mianheng from 1999 to 2011, and Chen Zhu from 2000 to 2007. Jiang Mianheng was the eldest son of ex-CCP leader Jiang Zemin. After Jiang Zemin ascended to power after the Tiananmen Square massacre, his son entered the academy and led the Institute of High Technologies Research and Development. Jiang Mianheng created the Shanghai Institute of Life Sciences and together with China Academy of Sciences, Shanghai Colleges and Universities, Shanghai Hospitals, military hospitals and research institutions, formed a profit group of life sciences organizations. They controlled China's major life sciences research projects and allocation of massive funding. Jiang Jicheng, son of Jiang Mianheng, is the controlling shareholder of Wuxi App Tech which in turn is controlling Fosun Pharmaceutical, China's agent for Remdesivir. Effectively, Jiang Ji Cheng is the kingpin behind the specific medicine for the outbreak. Meanwhile, Chen Zhu is the current president of the Red Cross Society of China, which had faced numerous scandals since the outbreak. In 1999, while Jiang Zemin was in power, the People's Liberation Army published a book, Unrestricted Warfare, 
in which strategies for a weaker nation to combat a stronger nation are discussed in the context of modern warfare. One of the authors, Chiao Liang, wrote, After the first Taiwan Strait crisis, we realized that if the Chinese and American military fought head-on, we are at a disadvantage. Therefore, we need a new strategy to help our military tilt the balance of power. This new strategy is called unrestricted warfare. A variety of means beyond all limits, without any restrictions. It could be military related, including guerrilla warfare, terrorism, biochemical warfare, or it could be non-military related, such as drug trafficking, poisoning, environmental destruction, and computer virus dissemination. Israeli expert in biological warfare and former intelligence officer Danny Shoham published a paper in 2015 in India's Journal of Defense Studies. He pointed out that China will not miss, skip, or abandon any highly advanced technology, especially military-related technology. The article noted that China had 12 facilities related to the Ministry of National Defense and 30 subsidiary facilities of the PLA participating in the research, development, manufacturing, testing, or storage of biological weapons. Dr. Francis Boyle, a Harvard PhD famous for drafting the Biological Weapons Anti-Terrorism Act of 1989, clearly expressed, the novel coronavirus we're seeing here is an offensive biological warfare weapon. The Federation of American Scientists indicated similar concerns in an evaluation report. The organization believed that the CCP possessed advanced chemical warfare projects including research, development, manufacturing, and weaponizing capabilities. The CCP is usually known to have a proactive biological warfare portfolio, including state-funded and sponsored research activities. I believe they have them. I believe they're developing them. I think they want to be the most advanced nation on Earth when it comes to biological weapons. The same as I believe that they do forced organ harvesting. The way I say the same as I believe that they have uh, concentration camps for Uyghurs. The way I believe that they have systematically killed millions of Falun Gong. It, it is the same thing with this regime. You can count on it. So Wuhan as an area I think is critical by the fact that there's a lot of concern about what China's ambitions are regarding long-term global domination. I'll just say it that. Their military doctrines indicated that they intend to be the dominant political and military force in the Pacific Rim. I've talked to senior members of the Trump administration who have had conversations with the senior Chinese generals, and that's what they basically say. It's in their doctrine, too. So we have to examine this new clue. That's, this is one piece of the, you know, Wuhan, biological warfare. Is that, does this mean something to these other things we're already seeing? because the Chinese have already kind of stated this is their objective. So I think we have to analyze it through that lens. What does this mean to the larger political narrative of what China wants to do to dominate the region and potentially the world? We don't have to speculate about being at war. Last May, the Communist Party, through People's Daily, carried a piece which said that there was a quote-unquote people's war against the United States. They've declared war on us, we have to respond. There is a war. China's told us there's one. At present, the Wuhan coronavirus pandemic has spread to about 190 countries with no signs of slowing down. The United States announced a state of national emergency. Europe became the new center of the outbreak. The world's largest art museum, the Louvre, and the Eiffel Tower are closed to the public. Tragic scenes, previously only found in Hollywood films, are now playing out live on the world stage. And given how closely it seemed to align with the Chinese regime's narratives, I can't help but question the role the WHO had in this catastrophic pandemic. Well, I think all you have to do is look at the photo of Tedros and Xi shaking hands, she standing there, T just going up to there, and it really is indicative of how China controls many of these international institutions. You can see that the WHO is essentially 
following Chinese Communist Party's guidelines. Um, you can see that the UN Human Rights Council is similarly following what China does. From the very beginning of the coronavirus outbreak, the Communist Party has done its best to prevent the CDC and others from studying the origin of this disease. We don't know what's there, but the fact that uh, the Communist Party is covering this up it should trouble us deeply. Then you see the World Health Organization take over YouTube. And what's amazing is now at the bottom of every YouTube video, even from Chris Martinson with his, uh, with his daily updates, and he's just reading facts. Now it's the World Health Organization is a forced link to go to the site, so for any person who doesn't know what, who the World Health Organization is, they go there to get the propaganda. Not the facts, not the truth, they get the propaganda, they get the talking points from the World Health Organization. And that is also very, it's a shame that American corporations, especially social media, like Google, like Facebook and Twitter, they're trying to censor or, or ban or shadow ban or manipulate algorithms, so on and so forth, to prevent an actual honest conversation. The best way this is going to be answered, all this, we want the truth. The biggest issue I've learned over my 40-year career, it's not really fighting the viruses and learning how to treat the viruses. It's fighting a system that is determined to cover up and persecute anyone who reveals the truth behind. Today, the World Bank, many of the international institutions have essentially adopted a posture whereby if the Chinese Communist Party tells them to do it, they're going to do it. I'm not surprised at all by what the WHO says. I'm not surprised at all by IKO, which basically has been blocking people from that tweet about Taiwan. I mean, the, the whole system, and this is why, by the way, the national security strategy that came out in December 2017 says what it says, which is we need to protect our societies, not just the United States, but all democracies. We need to rebuild them not invest Chinese Communist Party regime in the Belt and Road Initiative and Made in China 2025. And we need to inspire people again to believe in democracy. Every country has diseases, but in China, they become national emergencies and global emergencies because the real disease here is communism. A sprawling and aggressive disinformation campaign unleashed globally by the Chinese Communist Party. The propaganda push, which has escalated in recent weeks, aims primarily to deflect blame over the Chinese regime's botched handling of the Wuhan coronavirus, to sow discord internationally, and to portray the image that the regime has contained the outbreak. During the investigative interview process, well-known scientists who once suggested a laboratory origin of the virus declined to be interviewed one after another. Some avoided the topic of virus origin completely. Some had already composed scientific arguments but abruptly retracted their papers. I felt as if a giant net of censorship was cast by the CCP over virologists around the world. Silence at this time could have consequences for the health and lives of billions of people. I watch CNN, I watch Fox, I watch CBS. Uh, and I try to make my own assessment. And a lot of the time, you can figure out what's really going on by what they're not saying. And in this case, there's a lot of things not being said. Bottom line, they want to make money from China. They fear the Chinese repercussions if they air this stuff. It just gives you an indication of how powerful the Chinese Communist Party is. Chinese Communist Party suppressing speech in the West because these companies make money from China and they're afraid that they're not going to make the Chinese Communist Party is going to punish them if they essentially publish this stuff or allow it to be aired. There is no other reason. I think we have to recognize your audience who haven't seen it, I highly recommend Chernobyl because the same basic governance model that screwed up Chernobyl, I would argue, is now in charge of the response of the coronavirus. So whatever you saw go wrong in Chernobyl, you could still see that potential here. I'm not saying it's going to be that bad. I'm just saying that the party, the central party, is the thing which they want to protect, their power. And people and nation issues are secondary to the continuation of power. The Communist Party is malign and it is grossly irresponsible. It has pressured governments to keep their borders open, and it had to know that that would result in the fast spread of coronavirus to other countries. This is uh, the worst sort of behavior 
and the world's got to understand that there will not be peace, there will not be good order and stability in the world as long as the Communist Party rules China. The Wall Street Journal writes a piece as China is a sick man of Asia. It needs to be corrected. It's not China is a sick man of Asia. It is the Communist Chinese Party that's a sick man of Asia. The Communist Party has policies that people abhor. And it's not just its reaction to the coronavirus. We see this with the suppression of rights, also with the holding of perhaps a million people, maybe even three million people in concentration camps. So um, this is just the essential nature of Chinese communism. Chinese communism is evil. While China pretends to be a responsible member of the international community, in reality, they are doing much to undermine the rule of law and human rights. We at the Epoch Times refer to the Wuhan coronavirus, or COVID-19, as the CCP virus. Because the Chinese Communist Party's cover-up and mishandling allowed the virus to spread throughout China and create a global pandemic. On March 24th, Texas lawyer Larry Klayman filed a complaint in Texas federal court seeking at least $20 trillion from the Chinese government. Klayman said in a statement, quote, the Chinese people are a good people, but their government is not, and it must be made to pay dearly. On April 4th, the British think tank Henry Jackson Society advocated for compensation of 351 billion pounds from the CCP to the UK. And that the government should pursue it through international courts. The same report called for a total compensation of 3.2 trillion pounds to the G7 for the damages caused by the cover-up of the outbreak. On the same day, the All India Bar Association filed a complaint to the United Nations Human Rights Council, seeking an unspecified amount as reparations from China over the global spread of the coronavirus. Let's start investing in our people. Let's start inspiring people to love democracy and transparency and open markets, not what the Chinese have, which is essentially, if you read document number nine, counter to every single one of those things. So, I mean, it gives us a real opportunity to kind of reevaluate the kind of world we want to live in and fight for the right side of that world. I want them to see the true nature of the Chinese Communist Party because when they do, they're going to wake up. And when that happens, democracies will begin to flourish again. And when that happens, perhaps, just perhaps, the people of China will have a chance. 